All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Anessa Olson, and I am pleased to welcome you to the Ames Public Library for our Your Rights, Your Libraries panel, which is part of the 20th annual First Amendment Days celebration. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. And now I'm going to turn it over to tonight's moderator, Julie Rosa of the First Amendment Days Committee. session tonight, which is your rights, your libraries, the First Amendment and the right to read. My name is Julie Rosa and I'm the First Amendment specialist at Iowa State University. And so part of my job is education and outreach about the First Amendment. Uh, I also teach some classes at Iowa State. And as Anessa mentioned, this is our 20th year of celebrating our First Amendment Days series of events, um, 20 years, it's pretty amazing. And uh, another reason it's amazing is we believe that Iowa State is the only institution, college or university uh, in the United States that uh, dedicates a week to celebrating and exercising our First Amendment rights. So we're pretty proud of, of that. And we hope to continue long into the future. I can't begin any session without asking this very important question. That is, what is the First Amendment? So audience, who wants to tackle that one? What is the First Amendment? Anybody? All right, I heard freedom of speech. Yes, so, and I heard a little hesitation, maybe a bit of a question mark, and that's okay. That's what our goal is, to educate individuals about exactly what is this First Amendment of ours, to better understand it and to recognize the freedoms um, that it protects. So beyond the freedom of speech, the First Amendment protects four other rights, which would also be freedom of the press, freedom of petition, freedom to peaceably assemble, which is what we're doing here tonight, and um, freedom of religion. So those are the five freedoms of the First Amendment, and we're glad that you could be here with us this evening. I wanna uh, say just a word of thanks to the Ames Public Library in collaborating with us this year. This is a really exciting endeavor for us to kind of branch out into the community a little bit more uh, with our programming. And Anessa has worked really hard to bring this program forward. And we appreciate the support of Sheila, uh, Susan in the back there, and then also Bree as well um, in working with us to bring this program here today. We're not only here live at the library, but we're also uh, available on Zoom and we have audience members joining us there as well. I know we wanna get right over into the panelists, but let me share a couple of housekeeping comments just um, so we're all informed here. First of all, there will be time for questions from the audience at the end of our discussion or near the end of our discussion. The panelists will not be able to answer um, specific questions about specific titles necessarily this evening, but those are important questions. And we do want to encourage you to write those questions down and we have a form in the back, it looks like this. If you would like to ask a question that could be passed along to one of the panelists, they would be happy to take those questions and get back to you. But we simply don't have the ability tonight to ask about uh, specific titles, but do indeed feel uh, free to uh, ask those questions. This same form can be used to write a question down if you would rather not walk to the microphone or have the microphone brought to you but you'd like a question asked. So again, that, that, those are available and Anessa's back there too if you uh, need one delivered to you. We're planning to wrap up at 8.20 um, and be out of here by 8.30, weather permitting, right? Fingers crossed. I'm pretty sure that uh, you know the, there's something about the First Amendment and weather because every year, year after year, right about this time when we're celebrating our First Amendment, there seems to be some sort of um, um, weather event in Iowa. So this is nothing unusual for us, but we will plan to end promptly at 8.30. This discussion will be recorded and uploaded to the library's YouTube channel. So again, we'll be sure to repeat any questions uh, for the recording uh, if needed in order to capture those. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get start started. I have my first question ready and it's a pretty easy one. My first question is, would you please share with us who you are and a little bit about your background? Definitely. 
Thank you, Julie. I'm Sam Helmick. I'm the Community and Access Services Coordinator at the Iowa City Public Library. I am also honored to serve in the capacity of Vice President of the Iowa Library Association, former Chair of the Intellectual Freedom Committee for the Iowa Library Association, and then I currently sit on the executive board for the American Library Association and have history as the chair to the Freedom to Read Foundation on the national level. And I would just say thank you so much for the opportunity to come in tonight and learn with you and give me an opportunity to visit another fun public library. This is delightful. Good evening. Um, I'm Sheila Schofer. I'm the director of the Ames Public Library. I've been here coming up on three years. And while I grew up and went to college in Davenport, Iowa, most of my library experience was at the Brooklyn Public Library in New York City, where I worked for 23 years. So I've come back home. Oops. Hello, I'm Robin Sin. I am the Director of Collections and Open Strategies at Iowa State University, at the University Library there. Um, I've been a librarian for a while, three decades almost, <laughs> um, and started as a science librarian and started working on scholarly communications and some copyright issues, and now I'm in collections. Um, I've worked at the libraries at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, the University of Toledo, Bowling Green State University in Ohio, Johns Hopkins University, the Sheridan Libraries in Baltimore, and now I'm here as of August. Mm -hmm. oh. Hi, I'm the non-librarian in the group. Um, I'm Erin Miller, I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning for Ames Community School District. Um, I do have ha I've had the fortune, good fortune of working closely with my librarians across my career. I started as a middle school and high school English teacher. Um, so I got to work very closely with my librarians to think about you know, what kind of text should kids read. I got to support librarians um, and our English teachers at the state level as the president of the Iowa Council of teachers of English. Um, and we had some really great conversations and learning around different things related to intellectual freedom, a little more targeted at the classroom, but had some overlaps. Um, and then um, now I get to support our, uh, we call them TTLs, so technology teacher librarians um, in the Ames district. So I'm very happy to be here tonight. All right, thank you and welcome. You can probably see why I didn't try to attempt to introduce these amazing individuals and the perspectives that they bring here tonight. And we're so thankful that you could each be here. Speaking of perspectives, why don't we start by having you share what your libraries, what role they play in your community. And in particular, I'm trying to differentiate uh, you know, between public libraries, maybe school libraries, the state uh, entity, et cetera. Great. So um, if I may, I'm going to answer that question twofold. Um, the Intellectual Freedom Committee and the Iowa Library Association obviously are there to promote the good work of all libraries, but I can speak more specifically to public libraries and the Iowa City Public Library, I would say, is the center of the community's life. Essentially, whether it's recreational or educational, we are there to steward and support the resources that you would like to pursue. But we also serve as thought partners. You come in seeking a job, looking for a house, trying to pick up a new um, hobby. And we are there to not only steward you to resources, but support you and, ch and champion you to that end. Additionally, we are an equalizer. This is a space where folks can be warm and cool and safe and protected. Um, from the outside environs, but this is also the space where you can fill out your taxes and access computers so that you can connect with your family. So it's the great equalizer as well. She, she started on the public library. So, you know, I think public libraries play a broad and crucial role in the communities we serve. And here at Ames Public Library, our mission is that we connect you to the world of ideas. And that might be, um, and that's for all ages, you know, so it's babies through seniors and everyone in between. We have general access to information, be that books, physical, electronic, online resources, movies, games, kits like park packs, STEM kits. So a broad range of materials, but it's also that means to connect. So that's the um, internet access, which is crucial to so many. Um, that's our computers, laptops, Wi-Fi, now our hotspots. And then these print, copy, fax, all those 
technologies that people rely on. And it's not just connecting people to things or to the internet, it's to each other. So I think our role as a community space with our study rooms, our meeting rooms, our programs, there's very few places left for free public assembly and the public library is one of those. And all these services help us, you know, support everything from early literacy to education and recreation, job readiness, workforce development, civic engagement, health, wellness, social supports. So that's a lot of value wrapped up in one public library. So we're proud of that. And I think we're a key part of a thriving community. Um, so academic libraries generally support the research and teaching taking place at their institutions. That's the primary goal. Um, libraries at public universities, such as ISU, consider the public part of the community that we support because we're a public university. Intellectual freedom, information equity, inclusion, diversity are very important to the ISU University Library. Those values inform the services and the collections we create to support the research and the teaching and the service at our, at our um, community. We provide both tangible and online published content for the students, staff, and faculty for their learning and research. And there have been people listing things on our fingers already, so I won't go into all of that. Um, we also include things like chemical and biological information and um, music and music scores and things like that. What an academic library does that may not happen at other libraries is that we enable the faculty and the graduate students at our institutions to make their research freely available to the world. So um, that aligns with our public and land grant university mission. So faculty can deposit data sets with us in our data share repository. We have a digital repository where faculty can put articles from journals that will be freely available for everybody to read. Um, graduate students make their dissertations freely available for, for everybody to read. Um, the digital press that we run out of the library publishes research journals that again, are free to read. Um, special collections and archives work to make ISU history available to all through projects like Voices in Color. We have another unit that focuses on digital humanities and they support um, projects like Tracing Race, if you've heard about that one. So we not only obtain content for their use, but we try to make what our community creates available to the world. So I think the school library has a really um, lucky job, and that is to um, create environments to support kids so that when they become adults in our community, they are excited about using our public library. <laughs> so I think it's a really nice uh, connection and pathway. So the, our librarians work really hard to create um, inclusive spaces so that um, any kid can feel confident and comfortable. We have um, different groups of kids that access libraries as part of classes and then we have especially in our middle school and high school the ability for kids to come and find a quiet study space or um, get some help like our, our librarians are amazing in helping kids with individual projects or group projects they might come in um, and we're maybe going a little bit more towards the online research right we don't have quite as many things in the library for kids to to research but um, the librarians in our schools do a really phenomenal job in supporting our students um in that way wow thank you I, I might circle back around to um ask you how you think libraries landed at such a central role in our communities over the years how you've seen seen that develop so i'll come back to that but it's just so clear what understated giants libraries really are they're, they're just um quietly going about their business and the business is so very important so let's move into, um, based on all these materials and services that you provide, what is the process for um, you know, selecting the books on the shelves or the other materials that each of you touched upon? So it involves an elaborate framework um, that starts with people, credentialed um, and educated staff that will specifically be hired or retained to curate the collection. And then uh, obviously a rubric system by which they, they accomplish that work, whether it be 
star reviews in academic journals um, and in selector catalogs for, for the materials that are coming out through publishing houses to the strategic plan of this respective library. But obviously if it's a popular collections library as well, community feedback and, and input from how they're circulating. And then it all has the foundation of the respective libraries um, collection development policy. So for example, at the Iowa City Public Library, selectors are guided by their policy to offer broad, current and popular resources and materials as opposed to maybe like archival or comprehensive which you may find in a different type of library. Um, we want to make sure that our collections align with the Library Bill of Rights, which obviously has its foundation in Iowa. So if you're, you're interested in a slight history lesson, you can learn about how um, those were developed in Des Moines in 1938. But then you also want to make sure that it's aligning with public values and current trends and relevancy to the conversations that um, an informed constituency would want to have in a democracy. All right. Um, so we have a uh, collection development policy that guides us as well. And we're a public library, so we aim for that current popular collections rather than the heavier research or curriculum driven. Um, we strive to offer diverse voices and viewpoints that reflect our community and meet the needs and interests that are available in a wide range of formats. So how do we do that? We have that trained professional staff who follow closely not only what's being published, but the demand for new formats as they evolve. We pay attention to things like pre-publication alerts. So we know what things are getting big publicity pushes or what's trending on bestseller lists or now these days, TikTok or social media. <laughs> um, book talk's a big thing. Um, what's being highlighted on talk show hosts or popular magazines or celebrity book clubs. That's just one way to kind of keep a pulse. But we also make sure that we have books that are on award lists for all ages. So if that's uh, children's materials, it's not just the, the Newberry or Caldecott you may have heard of, but also books like or award lists like Pira Bell Prey or Credit Scott King or the Stonewall Awards. Um, we also look to our professional organizations or other associations to help us identify um, best books or recommended books or book lists. Uh, but most importantly, we listen to our community. So we look at our holds requests on items, note what's checking out. We have a request an item button that's embedded into our catalog and also on our website. And we get dozens of requests each month. Some of those we will interlibrary loan to get those books to you from another library, but often we purchase those. So use that feature. Um, don't, don't be afraid to um, ask for what you'd like. Um, and as part of our strategic plan, the Ames Public Library is doing a diversity audit. So we've begun some work in evaluating the diversity in like our picture books, our book club sets, and our monthly displays, just as a way to kind of test out some different strategies to do that. But that's something that's happening in a lot of libraries. And so we are going to do a whole scale um, evaluation of our entire collection so that we can kind of see how are we doing? Are there areas that maybe we're not representing enough voices and kind of work to, to remedy that? Um, and we follow that same thoughtful process um, for not just our books, but also our movies, music, and other items. Diversity on it. I'm going to have to talk to you. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, research university libraries, huge concerns. Um, we purchase and subscribe to lots of different content types in a wide variety of disciplines to support the research and the learning that's going on on campus. Um, we have policy and procedure documents that guide all of these decisions. Um, we have an overarching collections and open strategies policy document, which kind of describes the values and the strategies of how we're gonna go about our collection work writ large. Intellectual freedom is at the top of that values list, followed by diversity, equity, inclusion, openness, accessibility, and privacy as well. So that's kind of where I'm focused. We have a whole raft of subject librarians that focus on building relationships with the different units on campus, like journalism or agriculture or, or things like that. Um, and they get to know the faculty and the research needs and the curricular topics and needs. And they do the instruction and the reference and the collection building down at 
the more item by item level. Oh, you need streaming, you need documentaries about this topic. I will go and find some and we'll we'll figure out what we need. You need books about this, these kinds of things. Um, and they write their own smaller level collection development policies focused on a topic and they go into a lot of detail like this year set is relevant or these languages are more relevant to this area than this area, things like that. Um, and then at the mid level, we also make um, we have collection groups of librarians that make decisions at like at the publisher level. So if there's a reputable university press that has good content in areas that we use, we'll buy all their books as they come out, just kind of know, you know, that's their, they have a long history, we trust them, and we're going to get their books. So we do that for books, as well as journals music standards, other other things like that. So it's kind of lots of levels of policies and knowledge of what the people need in our community. We have a um, school board policy that gets to guide some of our um, selection materials, those kinds of things. Um, for the, I was talking to the school librarians about this um, this week in preparation for tonight and said, you know, what do you use? How do you implement the board policy? Um, and so they were sharing things about how important it was for them to get student voice in what is in their library collections. What do kids, kind of like what you were saying, like what are people checking out? What are kids interested in? Um, but when you were talking, I was thinking, gosh, we also, uh, they were also sharing about how they partner with teachers to find out, you know, what are you doing in your classrooms and how can I support you? What do you need? Um, and thinking about that, um, we also sort of an interesting middle. All right, um, I, I'm, I'm going to stick with you for just a second. Sure. Tell us a little bit more about windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. That reference, um, uh, explain that. Yeah, I wish I could. So I would have to, I did not write down where I read it the first time, but okay. it was talking about like when you're looking at classroom materials, could be curricular materials, library materials in this case, um, is there a way for you to see yourself, right? So if you think about your, your identities, um, are those reflected in there? Um, and then also, how are they reflected? Reflected, right, because I might um, sometimes we see negative stereotypes. So we we see maybe um, the book has a person of color in it, but they're they're um, presented in a way that is really falling into a negative stereotype. So we need to think about not only um, if there is a certain identity in the book, but how is it being portrayed? And then the other kind of conversation there is who's the author, right? Are we writing about something we don't know, or is it somebody that has some lived experiences that is writing it? So we also also look at authors um, when we're thinking about that. Um, and then can we peer into somebody else's, that's the, the window, right? Can we kind of peer into somebody else's experience? And then sliding glass doors is, I think of more of like an immersion. <laughs> can I walk through it and really experience? Um, so that to me would be that perfect alignment of um, an author who had a lived experience kind of writing in that way. But I will look up unless somebody up here knows who said it first, who, uh, where I read that and, and let you know. Sure. Thank you. And you know, what a powerful metaphor, though, in thinking about libraries and, and their materials. Uh, it clearly a lot of expertise. 
a lot of thought, a lot of uh, considerations go into these decisions. I'm guessing, though, that there are, t at times, requests for and challenges to the materials that are selected. So let's talk next about um, how those requests are managed. Great. So from the Iowa Library Association Intellectual Freedom Perspective, um, it starts with a policy. It starts with a recon reconsideration process baked into your policy. And um, common practice, common uh, suggestion would be that if your library doesn't have one, it should, because that is one of the tenants that Julie talked about with the First Amendment, the right to petition grievances to your government. And your library is a form of government, so we have to have a mechanism by which we do this. Um, but it does run the gambit. Some, some of us interpret that mechanism as circulation of a popular collection. So if it's not circling, it will eventually be weeded out. But if the community is continuing to check it out, then it obviously wants this, this material in the library. So the proof is in the pudding. And then there are others who will literally, inside their, their collection policy, their development policy, add this rec reconsideration process, which can be anything from a conversation across this public service point, to an escalation ladder with a form, to talking to a director, to a, to a committee that would look at the artifact in its entirety and determine what are the next steps for its life in this collection. Okay. So usually um, our concerns would probably come in the form of a conversation or a complaint, possibly at a service desk with a staff member. And we encourage staff to really listen and you know, sometimes people just want to be heard. They're upset by something or they're not understanding something and they just want to be heard. So we encourage that dialogue and um, often offering someone something else that will fit their need. Because ultimately when it comes down to, you know, people are free to choose what they personally want to read, but they don't get to decide what others read. And sometimes we have to gently remind people of that. Um, and we have to consider the needs of the entire community. So it might not be the right book for you and you can choose to not read it, but you don't get to limit the access to it for someone else. Um, so often it's resolved at that level. You know, staff might offer if someone's still a little upset to let them talk to a manager. Ultimately, if it's not um, resolved, they can, we have, um, we have an expression of concerns policy that's on our website. And we do have a statement of concern uh, form that someone could fill out that would come to the director and it would be up to me to respond. Um, and if that wasn't, if they needed something further, they have the option to go to our board. I'd say generally things are at that dialogue level resolved. University libraries are different again. <laughs> uh, we get much, many fewer challenges than school and public libraries um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, I think the first reason is that everyone's generally 18 and older and an adult and they care for themselves. And, and there's, there's nobody worried about things happening outside of their purview. Um, also, by definition, our collections include different points of view. That's the whole point of a university library, is to provide research and opinions and perspectives on um, history, current events, fiction, nonfiction, um, science, um, art, literature, the whole, whole gamut. So we tend not to get those kind of challenges. At the ISU library, if there were a challenge, what would happen is if it happened in person, it would be passed up to me, or they would find the right web page and email me and ask the questions. And I would hope it would resolve in a dialogue. I reached out to my predecessor who'd been in that post at least 20 years, and he can't remember any challenge in really? that time. So it's it's not something we anticipate. And and so I will say that in um, looking around at some other academic libraries, they just come flat out and say, we don't do that. We, we serve our university, you know, we are professionals. We serve our university, intellectual freedom, academic freedom to read what you need. And once it's in the collection, it's in the collection. 
going to start every answer this way, I feel like, but we have a school board policy about that. Um, <laughs> so we get to follow our school board policy on reconsideration. Um, and that board policy does cover both curricular materials as well as library materials. Um, so that board policy directs folks to start with the person closest to the material. So if they want, uh, have a question about something in the library, they would start with the school librarian and have a conversation with the librarian. Um, if they're not able to resolve it at that level, then they would contact the school principal and they would have a meeting with the school principal and the school librarian and the and the person who was finally or, or wanting to talk about the material. Um, and then if that's not resolved, then they can um, petition the, the district reconsideration committee. So that's a committee that meets annually each fall to just um, to make sure we have a standing committee um, and to make sure everybody on the committee knows the policies and, and what might be asked of them and that they agree to serve. Um, that includes a school librarian, it includes um, a, a classroom teacher, it includes a community member. Um, and so there's at least one of those. And, and if it's a secondary, if we can pull in a secondary student, we try to do that. Um, but we have a standing membership there and then um, they can fill out a, a form that um, then we'll have that committee meet and the committee will review the request, review the material um, and then make a decision. So part of, we were talking earlier, part of our reconsideration committee does state that the material stays in the library until the reconsideration committee um, decides what is going to happen with that particular material. Um, I know K-12 schools and school libraries have been in the news about different reconsideration um, requests. Um, we haven't had one yet this year, but we have had our standing committee meet um, and have been, uh, you know, so we're prepared to support um, any requests that the community might have about our materials. Okay, good. I have one follow-up question for Robin. I hope this event doesn't create some, uh, you know, flood of requests, um, but it sounds like you have policies and procedures in place to deal with that anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but Sam, I want to come back to you before I move on to my next question. You brought the First Amendment, and I think that's so important. And a lot of people don't um, understand that the First Amendment really prevents the, our government from restricting our freedoms. It doesn't necessarily apply to private entities in the same way, but a public library is standing in the shoes of our government. And so a part of the First Amendment that we become concerned about is viewpoint discrimination. And I wondered if you could sort of contextualize this idea of requests based on viewpoint and how really um, uh, public libraries at least are not able to act on those requests. So just talk a little bit about viewpoint discrimination. Oh, um, that's that's great. Um, I think I would like to borrow a little bit from Aaron, where essentially the role of the library is to provide information that reflects your experience, but also to make sure that you are benefited from the wealth of the experiences outside of your own. And so when a viewpoint challenge comes to um, to play, it's very difficult for us to meet that objective and then also meet this request. I think if I'm understanding the question correctly. Absolutely. Um, and then essentially there's also just the, um, the emotional toll of knowing those populations that you want to serve and reach out to that are maybe underrepresented. And so when you do finally find something in a, in a catalog that you can purchase that is, at, you know, like, is relevant and it represents them and then it's immediately questioned. For example, like Maya Kababe is genderqueer. Um, you have to kind of take off that hat because you are you are serving in the role of, of government and remind yourself that while folks asking for this book to not exist in their in their community library is an erasure of your personal experience, I was not I was not elected to make those decisions. I was a, I was hired to do a job and I trained to do a job. And so we're going to we're going to look at this challenge and we're going to val it, we're going to balance that with our strategic plan and our and our our, our policy and and we're going to find a path forward together. So I like the the quote: "If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you." Ah. And so I lean into these learning experiences. Great. I think a lot of my colleagues do. Yeah, and thank you so much for that. I just I think so often demands are made. Um, and it's the beauty and the curse, if you will, of the First Amendment that that demands are made based on viewpoint, but really, um, oftentimes, we don't have that luxury to accommodate someone's particular viewpoint um, because of the First Amendment. It sort of it steps in the way of and makes sure that uh, these very ideas that you all are presenting are protected because they're just so important. So thank you. Thank you for that. 
How would you describe, um, you know, the current environment in Iowa? And this is to, to any of the panelists, but we'll start maybe with you, Sam, again, um, in terms of challenged materials or collections management processes in general. And Robin kind of mentioned that there haven't been many um, on the radar, at least uh, from that perspective, but how would you describe the current environment here in our state? So I'm gonna be candid, I'm gonna call it bittersweet um, because um, we do see an increase in challenges and sometimes uh, it feels like it's because of like the cultural war and the Overton window that is kind of closing in on us as a society sometimes right now, it feels like a reflection more about that. Where the sweetness comes in is it's engagement. It's an engagement in your school library, your academic library, your public library, and it's an opportunity to reconcile these conversations in this environment, which is exactly what libraries were supposed to do, open up the world of information and debate of, of concepts so that we could come forward as a democracy with the strongest ideas possible in our moment in time. It's also sweet because it's an opportunity to sit here with folks like Sheila and talk to you about the essentiality of public libraries and why they're important in society and the other roles that they play. So while the controversies do seem to be reflective of maybe some political grifts and some cultural debates, and unfortunately public libraries and school libraries have been pulled in as a makeshift battlefield against our wills as we try to do the good work that libraries do, there's silver lining here and there's public engagement and shucks, that's never a problem, right? I'd echo that. I think it, there, it's it's concerning, you know, it, you hate to see the work that you do lost in the distraction of a phrase in one book, you know, but it is important. Intellectual freedom and freedom to read is our foundation. So it's important work to do. Um, I think it's interesting. The American Library Association recently um, commissioned a uh, poll and found that what was it a majority of um i'm gonna i wrote it down um basically that a more majority of people supported were against bans and censorship in their libraries and supported the work they did so yes yeah, she's saying 67 percent school 70 percent public and that was across the political spectrum so i don't think i think that says that it's the majority of our communities believe in what we do, support intellectual freedom, the freedom to read that. And, and I think that's kind of heartening a little bit when I saw the results of that. Um, and I, I'd add that we have the support. We have, we, it brings us out, we support each other. So we have our Iowa Library Association, we have our state, you know, our, we have district consultants who help us, who like will help you review, do you have a policy so that you're prepared to handle this? Um, the American Library Association, the Office of Intellectual Freedom. So there, there is support and there's colleagues um, and we rally around and support each other. Yeah, not much has, has changed <laughs> as far as when you're talking about viewpoints and, and, and rifts like that. I mean, we're still, you know, Iowa is still budget challenge. So we're still trying to just meet our general collection development um goals with a budget that's static or even a little smaller and we're trying to in, enlarge the collection in terms of inclusiveness and different authors and and different languages and and all of that because we realize that historically we've been buying year after year after year from certain publishers which represent a certain point of view um, and we need to broaden that collection. And so we're trying to work towards that now. So it's affecting us, but little differently since we're not the focus of challenges. Um, so I, I agree about the, the sweetness of engagement. I really appreciated that. Um, I feel like an aim. So I, um, have worked in the district since about 2008. And my experience coming to Ames was that the, the families of the students that I had um, were so engaged in the in the district and in the curriculum and in the in what their students were doing and that was coming from a high school teaching stance which was not my experience in another place like by high school folks had kind of you know okay they're in high school but here folks were so really passionate about being involved and so that's still 
still true in lots of different areas of my work. We have a really supportive community um, and folks are really engaged. So I've always appreciated that. Um, when we're talking about maybe the current landscape, we have some, there's some laws being considered at the state level um, that would um, maybe add some requirements um, around, like one of them is adding the transparency of your school library um, list. And we already do that. <laughs> um, so we have uh, Destiny and we can make it, you know, it's available online. Um, our teachers are really open with families. Our, our schools try to be really open with families about what resources we're using. Um, so, so there are some versions that would create more work for our teachers. So I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not trying to be dismissive of the hard work they would need to do to, to increase even some transparency. But I think um, a lot of our conversations have been like, that's great. That's what we want. We want um, families to know what's going on. We want you to talk to your kids about what they're reading and experiencing. And if you have questions or concerns about it, we, we of course want you to come um, and engage in a conversation with the teacher or the school librarian. Um, and we want to support you in what you um, think is, is best for your child. I think what the point was made earlier, I think about like, um, we're, we also need to, because we're a public school district, we need to have space and hold space for folks with lots of different um, ways of thinking about things and, and have access for kids. So I'll just, maybe it's a better teaching example, but um, I also had a classroom library when I was a high school English teacher. And um, I would send a note home even to my juniors and just let folks know, like, hey, I have a library. If you have any concerns or there's anything, you know, you want to talk with me about before your student were to have permission to engage with my classroom library, please let me know because we are a K-12 system. Our kids are not 18. Um, and we need to partner with our parents about how do we um, best support their goals for their students and the students' goals for themselves. So, thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, Sheila, you mentioned the poll, which I think uh, is so important to note that sometimes the headlines can sort of, um, you know, capture the negative, and it can feel like the the books are being asked to be removed all over. Um, but the reality is, the majority of us support our libraries and the collections. What could we do, those of us who do, you know, really believe in this, um, the importance of the right to read, what can we do to help our libraries? And I'll start with you, uh, if you don't mind, since you shared the poll numbers. I think continuing to use us and support us and being vocal, I think, you know, making sure your elected officials know how important it is so that our funding continues to be strong and healthy, you know, considering donating your time or your or for our friends foundation. Sure. And I think just engaging, coming to programs like this, being involved, I think that's you know, that that helps us out, you know, you hitting that request button, you know, making sure that you are part of um, making sure that the library reflects what you want it to reflect because it belongs to all of us. And I, I would say that. May I add? Oh, please. Because you all are here, I believe you're invested. So I may ask a little bit more of you and an appreciation ahead of time. Um, we can only curate and, and, and obtain what is published. So Julie made a really good point earlier that while government entities are kind of you know, like fenced in and, and, and boundaried and, and well understood through the First Amendment, what publishing houses decide to print, what, what um, warehouses decide to, to produce and, and to send out, are not within the purview or control of your public library. So as citizens, it is important for you to be aware that th that, that cultural war is existing also in the, in the private sector. And you might, might you know, do well to, to concern yourself and, and have a voice to what you wanna see published because I, I can't curate topics that no longer exist in printed form. Important point. Any more advice or suggestions for those of us who want to do more to support our libraries? I, I appreciated the advocacy for funding. Um, we are pretty lucky in Ames. We do have um, some community groups. We had a group give a few thousand dollars to the high schools for the express purpose of expanding the, the classroom teachers libraries and the, the books that, that students have access to. So I feel like, um, again, we're, we're in a very fortunate place here, but I know there's lots of schools um, across the state that might not be quite so fortunate. So um, advocacy for, for funding, at least for 
for our public libraries is always helpful. Um, and I know that we also take volunteers for things like book fairs and different things that go on at schools. <laughs> If you're an alum or you live near a university or a small college, consider supporting the library they're in. Something that happened um, in a previous position, it, the dean of the library, when told, you know, budgets were being cut and so she was trying to look for funds for, you know, for elsewhere. So she wrote a letter to all the graduates of that university, assuming that they'd all had a chance to use the library because mm -hmm. every student had, has that chance. And she was swatted down for that because the deans of the schools who granted those degrees got first dibs on all the alums. Uh -huh. And so the library couldn't go ask for support, financial support from those people because the School of Education or the School of you know, um, economics, whatever, had the first shot. Yeah. So if, if you live near a nice university or college or are an alum of one, consider supporting the library when you get those letters. Absolutely. Again, <laughs> this idea of just understated giants doing the work that you do without needing, you know, needing more. Um, I'm going to be ready for questions in just one moment. So be thinking about what you want to know. My last question before I turn it over, though, is I'm just fascinated by each of your paths to this career. And I just want to hear a little bit more about what led you into a job with the library. So I was pre-law. I was going to come to state. Um, and I was in a small um, uh, religious uh, private college and you had to do responsible social involvement. And I didn't use my library. Um, when I was a teenager, I just did not quite feel welcome. So I actually um, didn't vote for the new library. However, because I needed that responsible social involvement, I thought, what an interesting place to volunteer because I have zero chill. I'm like, I wonder if I could do this here. And when I went into the library, I was a different person. It was a different library. It was modernizing to meet the needs of the community. And so I'm like, you have eBooks? Well, yeah. You have cake pans? I, can, I don't have to buy a cake pan. I can just check one out. And they're like, yeah. You have programs for children and teens? What if you've been, you've been living on a, a cave in Mars with your fingers in your ears? I'm like, I guess I, I'm in love with this. And I, I fell in love with it and they didn't change the locks. In fact, they not only let me be a volunteer, but they started hiring me for different levels. And um, the rest as they say is what's happening now. So I'm just, I'm kind of in love with what we do and the good that we produce. We're, we're storage, cold storage information. And then you all come in and breathe life into it. And it's just, it never ceases to be a really beautiful experiment to me. I was, I used the library heavily. My mom and I went every Saturday and there was the bookmobile was sometimes at our school, sometimes at a local park. So I went, I was an avid user. I did not have like some, some of my colleagues over the years, like I knew I'd be a librarian. <laughs> I did not. I was an English and history undergrad and had considered going, um, had applied to go forward in American studies and thought, oh, well, you know, what will I do? But I knew I didn't want to teach. I knew that. And I thought, the more I thought about it, the more I thought my path in that route would be towards teaching. And I thought this would, um, I had a few professors whose wives were librarians. And actually that's one that got me to Kent State where I did my graduate degree because I'd applied for schools around, but I got a great package at Kent State and I would never have applied there if I hadn't known her. Um, and so I ended up going to library school, loving it. And then from there, because I'd already left Iowa, I was kind of open to going wherever. And I went to a, the American Library Association conference to see what jobs were out there. And I ended up um, in Brooklyn, New York, and I did not know a soul there. Um, but I had a great experience at a really large urban public library. And yeah, that's my my story. And I, I did have in, in college, I had, um, my mom worked at the university and her, um, her a, a friend of hers worked in the bursar's office and they said, she was not going to get her diploma because she has library fines. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm kind of a shameful librarian. <laughs> 
<laughs> when I was a young person, I thought I wanted to, well, I did want to be like a park ranger or something. So I got my undergraduate actually down at Coe in Cedar Rapids in biology. Um, thought everyone then, then after that, then I was told, if you really want a, one of those jobs, you need a master's and eh, things happen. So I ended up um, looking for a job, any job, and took a job at a public library outside of Philadelphia and fell in love. And then was flashbacks. It was just like, oh, all the time I spent rearranging all the books in my room, first by <laughs> author, and then I get tired of that. And then it would be by alphabetic, by title, and then it would be by topic, all the myths, all the Nancy Drew. Anyway, so at the public library, I was like, oh, and you know, you catalogers, and I was an assistant to the reference desk, and I had to actually type out the interlibrary loan forms and pack all the bags of books as they moved, the, the courier moved them around the county. And so then I went to library school after that. And when um, my advisor, who was the only person on the faculty with, she, her undergrad, her, she had a doctorate in um, marine biology, actually. And she said she got tired of throwing um, inner tubes off the end of piers for barnacles to grow on them. And then she became an information professional. She said, as long as you have a science undergraduate and a background and you're willing to move, you will always have a job in academic, academic libraries. And I started in Philly in a historic science library with um, the Academy of Natural Sciences, which was a really interesting job because it was in one of those big old diorama based museums. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, you could hear, you could go down at lunch and look at the T-Rex and look at this and look at that and all the, you know, every once in a while people would come into the library because it was open to the public and, and protest all the taxidermy because there were also videos showing, they've since been removed, all those expeditions shooting all those mm. animals. But I did at one point know German, Russian, and French for all the terms volume, issue, yearbook, journal, hand, you know, I knew it all. I knew all the Roman numerals up to, you know, whatever. It was fun. And then I moved into academic libraries, but it, yeah, it, it was a lucky find. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember a time that I didn't love to read, I guess, um, from when I was little, I was in um, seven different school systems across three states in my um, K, four states in my K-12 career. So we moved around a lot, um, but libraries were always a constant. So my, similarly, I remember my mom taking us to the library. So it was kind of fun to get to go to the new library in the new town. Um, currently, I torture my husband because every time we go on vacation, I have to stop at the public library um, where we go somewhere. So he doesn't think that's quite as fun as I do, but he's coming around. Um, anyway, uh, so so that's just sort of part of um, reading and, and a love of books was just always sort of part of who I was. Um, I did end up going the English teaching route versus the, the school librarian route because when I was student teaching, I was actually like, is this what I wanted? You know, you're kind of questioning, but I fell in love with the kids. Um, so that's why I stayed in education. Um, so anyway, now I'm here. Okay, thank you. Sounds like we have a book here, something about confessions <laughs> of the unintended librarians. Um, but thank you very much for sharing your stories. Let's hear from you. What do you want to know about collections management or libraries um, or, or anything else that we can we can answer for you? Is there something in your library that is not, uh, cannot be taken out by everyone? Um, and why and what? We do have some reference materials, you know, that are for use in the library, but we would certainly make copies of them or copies of materials or things like that. Our, our goal is access, but sometimes there's, you know, maybe a particular reference source that doesn't, um, doesn't lend itself to being lent as easily. <laughs> but I think those are shrinking more and more. 
mean, we obviously are reduced to like limited to our students and our staff. Um, so, so you, folks that aren't associated with the district can't come in and, and check things out. And a lot of our online, especially our research resources are through passworded, you know, systems. So you have to be part of the district. Just because of the general nature of funding of materials, you may have more access at your local public library as opposed to like as a reciprocal or open access borrower. So in Iowa, we have this agreement where you can borrow, let's say like you can have, you can live in Burlington, but you can have an Iowa City Public Library card. However, the digital resources are paid by Burlingtonians for their Burlington Public Library. So as an Iowa City, and now I don't have access to those, just their physical materials and then vice versa. Um, and that's something to think about, not only when we talk about what publishers um, are willing to publish, but also what they're willing to charge your public libraries and your tax dollars to accomplish that. So sometimes when things have limited access, it's because our hands are tied as, as stewards of the collection um, in order to make it accessible at all. Yes, at, um, well, the Iowa State University Library is larger and we have a large special collections and archives unit where you cannot check things out because those aren't what you typically think of as published content. They're letters. I think we have a sword up there somewhere. Yeah, they're, they're, they have things <laughs> as well that are part of the history and that we have recordings of old TV shows and, and, th and lectures and we're trying to digitize those to make them available. But to get back to the electronic side of things, yeah, we have to sign licenses and pay a lot of money for ISU and we're charged by how many people we have involved. And that's part of the reason when I was talking earlier, if you remember, I was talking about how we're trying to make the research done by our people available freely to the world to get around some of these paywalls mm -hmm. because research is being slowed down and just because you're not associated with a big university or research institution doesn't mean you're not interested. Mm -hmm. You know, think, you know, the interested high schooler in Pella or, you know, whatever, think they should have access to, th especially if the research is mostly funded by the government, back to the government. All right, off my hobby horse. <laughs> <laughs> is there a circumstance where if a parent challenges a book, in a library or in the curriculum that it can actually be removed? Yeah. Yep. The reconsideration committee would meet. Um, and if that committee, so there's some inboard policy, it kind of spells out um, the standards under which if it failed to meet them, that we would recommend removal. So if it didn't have academic um, or literary value is one of the lines in there, um, that if the committee determined that, then we would um, remove it from the collection potentially. Is that what parents are objecting to? Not typically. So then, <laughs> uh, First Amendment and parents' opinions that those generally then aren't right. removed. Yeah, if, if we can, than it's yeah, if we can demonstrate that. that it has academic and literary value and and be able to clearly explain the rationale for it, um, it's maybe a little bit um, different if we're talking about library materials versus if we're talking about curricular resources that we're requiring all students um, to engage with. That's a slightly different policy, but or a different implication, you know. Yep. If I can piggyback on that, that's why the coalition between public and school libraries are essential, because while we may not be seeing quite a lot of that in Iowa, we are seeing pockets of it around the country where those decisions are being made, despite the fact that there are also parents that would like to retain it. And so by making it available at the public library, there's still an option for caregivers and parents. Mm -hmm. Right now in this like digital age, has there been a noticeable decrease in interest in books or what have you seen with that among like the younger kids? So um, I'm a millennial, which means I'm the generation of the first $7 paperback from amazon.com. <laughs> so we're pretty happy with the heft and the smell of the ligdom that comes from a physical book. And what we've noticed with the pandemic is it's almost like escalators and stairs. Both exist, but both are loved and utilized. Um, so essentially what 
public libraries are being challenged with now is that ebooks are so significantly more expensive than like multiple copies of a physical book, but then you want to increase that accessibility to your community so that they can access their library wherever they're at on their phone in, in the stacks that what's what's the struggle right now is that we are seeing an increased want of both medium mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out how we fund that need is the is the difficulty so that is an excellent question because i assumed as well it's like well i won't be working with physical books in a couple of years and I'm like was i absolutely wrong about that assumption yes yes I, I'd agree. I think our, our use of electronic resources continues to grow, but in while our print might be, or print circulation or checkouts might be going down a little bit, um, I think at libraries across the country, that's the case, I think, but it, it's because it's offset by that digital. So the overall circulation um, is still healthy and strong. I think the challenge is to, like she said, buy um, in both formats because someone wants the book, but someone wants the audio and someone wants the ebook. So kind of trying to balance all those needs. I, I would say it's similar and yet somewhat different in academic libraries because you have to understand that many of the books that the academic libraries buy, people don't sit and read the whole thing like a novel or even a New York Times nonfiction bestseller. They want a chapter or two out of them if it's an edited volume or they only want one section. Um, the journals have went online back in 1990. Seven. So no, nobody wants paper issues of, of journals anymore. But, but the books, it's a disciplinary difference, and I'm not going to bore you with it all. But, but again, people, some people want the book, some people want the e. But after COVID, we've become an e preferred. We will buy both if we absolutely have to, but we really don't want to because budget. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the budget isn't growing to accommodate getting two and three versions, just just like everybody else said. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a, an interesting thing when we're talking about um, both um, titles at the school library, but also curricular resources, right? Like things kids read in class. Um, we have a growing population of English language learners. We have a growing population of, of students who uh, maybe are, are not quite as adept at decoding initially, need some more support. So the online formats give better access. We can do more with text-to-speech. Um, we can do more with translations. We can do more with, I'm going to touch that word and figure out what it means because I don't know yet. Um, so there's lots of support. So I think the teachers are doing a really good job trying to navigate um, how do I teach kids both both ways because they're going to have to as they grow interact with both things. Um, we were just having this conversation the other day about um, you know, when we're looking at textbook purchasing even or, or library purchasing, um, I think in education, maybe this is true outside of education, but we think our job is to prepare them for the next level, right? So elementary teachers are like, well, what are they going to do in middle school? Because we got to get them ready for that. And middle school teachers, what are they going to do in high, in high school? It's like, well, in college, what are they going to, are they going to have to read a textbook? Are they going to have to read all online? Like, we got to get them ready for it. So we're constantly thinking about that. Um, so I think being in touch with these folks, I'm really excited about because we can talk about what are the ways um, that might be best for, for especially our younger students to think and interact with text. I think it's interesting formats can vary by where you're at too, because um, a, a colleague in DC, um, they their e-collection is really strong, way, way markedly different than what we what we're seeing, we still have much more demand for print or, or a still have a healthy demand for print and they're not seeing that as much. Or um, I think it's if you're in a commuting area too, that people like the digital. So, um, you know, yeah. commuting places don't, like if you're commuting on public transportation, you you probably retired your physical CDs, <laughs> but we still, you know, we're watching that because we still have people who absolutely love those, but, you know, format shift and sometimes it's gradual. Just to add another level of complication because access is, is directly related to the First Amendment. And so it is a First Amendment issue as we come to streaming and, and things mm -hmm. like Spotify, mm -hmm. the library's ability to not only procure that but to make that affordable and accessible will, will also be a complication. Mm -hmm. So we have like seven spinning plates and two of them are on fire, <laughs> but we're figuring it out as well as we can. Um, and we appreciate your advocacy and support as we all learn together, right? Mm -hmm. 
This has been great. I'm a librarian as well. So I have a question. I work with Robin at Iowa State. And one of the things that, that I think about that is so wonderful, like about this panel, is that we're being proactive and we're talking about these things that are usually done outside of any visibility of our patrons and our users. So what are other strategies that our libraries and our schools could take to be proactive about this conversation? You know, we have our policies ready, we're ready to react, but how can we preempt some of these things that are happening in our communities um, and just be a little more proactive? That is a great question. So I just came back from a working weekend of executive board meetings at the American Library Association where we had asked the Office of Intellectual Freedom to give us calls for action. Awareness is great, but what can we do with that awareness? And so they came back and they just launched this week, um, unitedagainstbookbans.org. Mm -hmm. And essentially this is going to be their advocacy wing where they're not they're not reaching out just specifically to librarians and library workers, but to you, to it concerns, you know, such uh, the constituency that's concerned about this this growing kind of social trend, and it gives you the opportunity to not only see what resources are out there for you to, to to learn more and to share more, but how you can support those in need, those who may be actually like facing not only termination but also arrest for making things available in our nation in 2022. And then also to tell your own stories because your stories are valuable. I can sit up here as a library worker all day and say first amendment and the books and they're great. But if you're a neighbor, you're a friend, you're an uncle, those stories matter. And so those are the three calls of action that the United Against Book Bans initiative is going to start launching over the next several weeks. And I invite you to check that out. I saw that and isn't it kind of videos or kind of audio clips so we'll continue to explore it too and see what, what we might do to kind of help facilitate that I do think telling stories is key you know the we see firsthand sometimes what an impact finding the right book can mean to especially to a young person who sees themselves reflected or um you know, sees their story or something similar, something they can relate to in a book. And we can see that the power of that, the impact that has. And I think, like you said, more people sharing that story um, or how, how you've been positively impacted kind of helps get that, that value out more front and center. I would say um, when, so the district, or at least the school, AIM school district, but I think the, the trend is across the state, trying to get folks okay. more involved proactively in curriculum review cycles, um, trying to get folks to um, give uh, feedback before, you know, as we're examining materials rather than after they're already in the, been purchased and are in the schools, um, because we are a community school district and we would like to have um, more invitations for folks to review materials and look at them and and give us um, opinions ahead of time and and that so I think sometimes politically too that um, if there's a bill being passed that's doesn't speak or you know you think it's too chilling and even if you know your local um, elected officials in, not in support of it sometimes going to finding out who who's on that committee or who's <clears throat> leading that bill and kind of because they listen to public individual citizens more than organizations so we can go to library lobby day and share something um, and we're kind of preaching to the choir if you have if your local elected official is um, you know on board but I think you have power as citizens contacting different legislators when, when they you know propose to pass stuff like mm -hmm. absolutely um i just have a couple of comments um the first was that my husband and i were both in the peace corps in the time when it first started and so one of the concepts that they had at that time may i have your attention please a severe thunderstorm watch continues for both Story County and Boone County until 1 a.m. Repeating, a severe thunderstorm watch continues for both Story County and Boone County until 1 a.m. So they thought we can't send people out to the boonies and who knows where without something to do. So they sent us out with libraries. We had, um, I think it was about 120 books in a, what they called a locker, something that closed and locked, and you were dropped off in your village with this library. And so even though we left, I'm sure they didn't send the library back. 
Yeah. <laughs> so all of these books were left out there. Um, then the second story is about Miss Frost, who was our um, high school librarian. And she was uh, down to earth, free thinking, and lace up shoes, and she got things done. And she was an alternate safe adult, uh, accessible to all the children in the school who helped a lot of people. And I'd like to just say something for the, you know, the angel librarians who are out there making contact with these kids to draw them into the wonders of the library and to um, make sure they know it's for them too. And um, then my question is, if you had all the money that you might want, I'm not a, I'm not rich here, but um, uh, what was, what would be the first thing that you would do in your own system to make it better? Not going to hesitate at all. Staff, staff, because we have no shortage of ideas or opportunities, especially in a community like Ames, um, and our staff see so much the potential of how we could serve more and even better, but you get maxed out on time. There's only, there's only so many people and so much time and um, staff. I would like to echo you both. Actually, um, first to say thank you for sharing your stories. Um, because I do feel like sometimes these conversations could erode the, the community trust and library workers and teachers and what we're doing. I think about the Richard Scary picture books and there was the firefighter and the mailman and the librarian. And I'm like, oh, trusted institutions, trusted peoples in society. And that is important to have. And it's also important to have credentialed and knowledgeable expert staff. And so I think that they kind of, is a, it's a marriage of the two things that you both are kind of exploring right here where it's like, that other adult, that, uh, that, that person who opens the door and says, come on inside to the world of ideas and imagination for the rest of existence, but then to also have credentialed staff to make that happen and manifest and be sustainable. Oh yeah, I, I think I'd go with staff too. Yeah, I mean, staff is probably, <laughs> I was thinking, yes. Um, so our library is closed for the summer um, because we don't, we have uh, our teacher technology librarians are on, you know, uh, nine month contracts, basically the teacher contracts and um, having the ability to engage with students and help them feel supported over the summer. I know there's lots of great work done in other organizations, including our public library over the summer, um, but that would be a cool way to extend some things. And then I also know that we are only able to get like at the elementary level they're on a four-day rotation so they come through once every four days um, and I know kids that they live for that day they're like is it my is it my library day today um, so we could get them in more often if we had more folks in there um, and I know that the because they do teach quite a bit they don't get to spend as much time as they would like to dedicate into doing their own research into you know what's the new thing that we need what would help support our students and help support our teachers so um yeah having two in each building would be awesome um we uh if you i don't know how many folks are following but it is um likely that we might get to add one at the, so we've had some some folks splitting um duties across buildings so i think we might be in a place where we can have one in each building so i'll be happy about that again when that is this year or next year fingers crossed mm -hmm. Yes to staff, because we're doing things with very few people. And we're trying, as I, as I said earlier, we're trying to, to hire the kind of people who, while many are credentialed librarians, some are also good publishers because we're trying to get the information at ISU out to the world. So we do need differently educated people who are very involved with that as well as um, supporting the library in general. But I would also want a chunk of whatever amount of money this is because <laughs> <laughs> whatever, half of infinity? No, I, I guess you can't do that. Um, I don't want to buy more published content. This is my, my um, tilting windmills hat. Um, what I want to do is, is have the money to give to organizations that are building the infrastructure to help make publishing more open instead of having to go to the bit you know it doesn't you don't have to go to penguin or 
Elsevier or other, you know, whichever publisher, and make it more democratic, small d possible for people to share their information. And of course, I've, I'm thinking more along research, but I think that could be said in many different venues. That's well said. That's well said, especially as they start to conglomerate. You yeah. know, it's like these media companies or publishers. Mm -hmm. It there's that that chill factor is there that you can start narrowing and narrowing and narrowing what's published. Agreed, because you may have the freedom to read, but the freedom of choice in what you read is is narrowing because mm -hmm. of that. And it's again, it's a it's a private entity, so it's outside of the confines of our of our First Amendment. So we need to utilize our First Amendment to make sure they know we're watching and, and have would like to hold them accountable to us as consumers. All right, so I'm sensing not only a book about confessions of unintended librarians, <laughs> but now also a lecture series where we can talk more about all these really important topics. So thank you, uh, you know, for bringing those forward. We're getting near the end of our time, but I'd like to see if there might be one or two more questions or anyone out there on Zoom. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to share that as well. Anybody else? Hello. Um, so my question to you guys are, um, so this year's um, lovely um, theme that we came up with is dare to speak, dare to listen. What is one way from us sitting here tonight, um, one takeaway from listening to you that you would really like to hammer home for us, that we might be able to speak to our communities, our coworkers, and anybody around us um, willing to share this with them after tonight? Hmm, that's such a powerful question. I'm getting like emotional about it. Um, I guess it's the same thing I want to impart to you as a library worker anytime we interact, that you have more power and efficacy than you probably ever dream of. Um, and I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for you to achieve your goals, and I am rooting for you to make manifest the importance of the First Amendment that it seems to be in your life. And so I, I encourage you, but also challenge you to look at these resources and make sure that your voice is heard because it is important and it matters and it's uniquely yours, which makes it beautiful. I think at the beginning when I kind of went through like what an impact libraries make in the community, I think, you know, we live and breathe libraries and some of our super users really know what we have to offer, but I bet there's more that we have, like we have role-playing kits and we have puzzles for kids and there's all, there's so much. So I think um, maybe sh helping us share that or turning on someone in your life, um, you know, telling them, sharing something um, exciting that the library has or a great lecture you went to or any anything that helps us kind of spread that word of like, there's something for everybody here and more things than you can even imagine. I think I'd go back to the whole freedom to read idea that everybody should be free to read something that speaks to them or meets a need at that point in time. And that that freedom to read doesn't keep anyone from engaging in their freedom to read whatever they want to read, that it's not. Yeah, I, I, I'm really tired of, of reading the bad, the bad news, which isn't predominant, which is predominant only because of the way the media works in the country. But, um, you know, that I don't want my child to read that, or I don't think I should read that doesn't mean I shouldn't read it. And I, I want that understood. That was very poorly said, but I think you got it. <laughs> I, I would go back to the idea of engagement, I think, and just um, being active and taking part in all the great things that I know all of your organizations put on. And then with, you know, when, um, if you have kids or you have the opportunity to engage in a community member, as a community member with the district, um, we just so appreciate, we want to be community spaces, um, both at the district. And I know I've heard everybody here say that, and we can't do that by ourselves, or it's just us. <laughs> um, so it needs to be a community, a true community effort. Beautiful. All right. So my key takeaway from this amazing session tonight is that we have libraries 
and librarians who are working incredibly hard to serve us, to serve me, to serve you and you and you and all of you and all of our different needs and wants and opinions and viewpoints and experiences. Uh, and we can all do more to support these understated giants, as I mentioned um, earlier on. So thank you and hold your applause for just one second because I would be remiss if I didn't ask probably the most frequently asked question of all librarians, oh, but no, can you no, please no, name a title <laughs> that we should all either be reading now or you know have hopefully read at some point in our lifetimes? I'm going to go with what I'm reading right now because it's timely, I think, to this topic. Um, I've been reading Harvard Business Review's Emotional Intelligence series, and they just came out with um, um, what's mindful listening. And so for me, this, this entire topic has been really helpful for me to understand the importance of, yeah, speaking, but also hearing and hearing to understand and hearing to engage and, and just encountering you all with curiosity and knowing that I'm going to learn and be better off before I leave. Um, so I guess I would say Harvard Business Review's uh, Mindful Listening has been pretty good um, <laughs> lately. And you should check it out. It's like 136 pages, banging out over a weekend. <laughs> I, I sometimes I, I worry about this question. I Because I have varied reading tastes and I'm always reading so, a few different things and always something a little wacky. Um, but I'm going to fall back to um, a book that that uh, I recommend often that kind of helped me with meditation and kind of mindfulness and that's Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn. I'm still thinking. Oh my gosh, I don't get asked this question uh, <laughs> hardly ever anymore. And the last time I got asked it, I'm pretty sure I was teaching, it was when I was teaching like high school. And so what the high school kids wanna read was probably maybe not the same. Um, so I think, uh, well, I'll just tell you what I'm reading right now. I'm reading the 1619 Project uh, because I am learning all the things I didn't know. Um, and I was interested because I figured as the director of teaching and learning in Ames, I was likely to get asked about it at some point. Um, and I don't like to... Um, you know, like say things about books that I haven't read or, or make assumptions about what's in them or not in them. So I think, um, I think I was talking with one of our staff members who's asking me, um, you know, why I was reading it. And I said, well, would you add, like, would you want to talk about this if you, if you hadn't read it? Are you, what assumptions are we making? And I think it's also important to, to then I think I'll have to find something also that maybe I, I wouldn't be drawn to, right? So I've tried to push um, into spaces or into authors that um, maybe I'm not as always as comfortable with. So anyway, that's what I'm reading right now. Okay. Yeah. I read a lot of white papers at work that nobody else <laughs> wants to read by different publishers and different research foundations. And then I just dive into fantasy. Um, so I think the last, um, well, the book that made the biggest impact on me, when I started working at ISU, I found that um, the, the library um, runs uh, book groups for staff and librarians on diversity and equity and inclusion. And I kind of, during lockup in the COVID era, I put my head down and did my work. And that was just my way of coping. So I've taken this opportunity and, and I finally read White Fragility. And I can't tell you what an eye-opening experience that was. Um, I think everybody should read it. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much to Sam, Sheila, Robin, and Aaron for spending your night with us, for sharing your wisdom, your suggestions, uh, you know, your expertise and everything that you do for all of us in the community who appreciate our libraries so very much. Thank you to the audience for being here and for being online. I appreciate you taking the time to out of your schedules, especially in light of the forecast and the, we heard the announcement over the intercom. I don't know if they heard it uh, online, but um, it, you know, the weather was questionable, but you're here and you're listening and we spent this time together and we're so thankful. It, our first amendment days week continues throughout the rest of the week. We have activities every single day. So if you enjoyed this delightful time together, 
I promise you there are other opportunities at Iowa State University this week where we can also continue these important conversations. So to Anessa and to Susan, to Bree out there, to the Ames Public Library, thank you for collaborating with us and uh, we'll see you at a future event.